in the previous video, I talked about what web exploit kits are. And then what I'd like to do in this particular video is I'd like to give a more uh, technical description, if you will. Uh, however, the description will still be somewhat uh, generic in nature so that it continues to stay relevant even as web exploit toolkits uh, evolve. And also, I'll try to keep the description clear enough so that it's accessible to a broader audience. I'm not sure if I'll succeed in that regard, but that's going to be my attempt. So first of all, at a more technical level, a web-based exploit kit typically, typically comprises a set of PHP scripts. Okay, and, and uh, there's nothing sacred about PHP, but that's what's uh, commonly used by a lot of attackers. And these PHP scripts basically form a wrapper, a wrapper around uh, traditional or not traditional exploits for vulnerabilities of applications that are used in the context of uh, doing web browsing. So these might include, for example, a user's web browser or a plugin uh, such as a PDF reader, a Flash player, uh, a Java plugin, and so on and so forth. All right. Uh, there are many other plugins actually that could potentially be exploited in a uh, in a web exploit toolkit. And some of the ones that we've seen in the past include things like QuickTime Player, uh, Shockwave, Silverlight, uh, Windows Media Player, and so on. These are all the different possibilities. And I should point out also uh, maybe one subtle distinction is that oftentimes in practice, the person who actually wrote the PHP scripts, who's typically considered the author of the exploit kit, may not be the same as the person who writes the actual exploit code itself. Uh, sometimes what will happen is that the author of the toolkit will in fact purchase exploits in various underground markets and then create wrappers for those exploits and then basically repackage that whole that whole package and sell it to a uh, cyber criminal. All right. So you can just think of the exploit market has some, there are people out there who want to buy exploits and one person who might want to buy an exploit is somebody who sells attack toolkits. All right. Now PHP is just a scripting language for creating web pages and PHP scripts can pretty much work on multiple platforms, which make them a, a very, very convenient choice. In fact, PHP is one of the most common choices for modern popular attack toolkits like, uh, like Black Hole, which I mentioned in the previous video. Though I do want to point out there's nothing sacred about PHP. Uh, really, any other technology for web development can theoretically be used as the basis of creating a, an attack toolkit. All right. Now the attacker's goal is going to get is going to be rather to get the victim to execute one of these PHP scripts with the hopes that the script will be executed by some type of a vulnerable application on the victim system. All right. Now uh, PHP scripts, you know, if you don't already know, uh, can be opened up in a web browser. They typically are used by different website designers for creating websites with dynamic content. All right. So all that said, how does the attacker actually get the victim to fall for all this and actually execute code. So what the attacker is going to first do is the attacker is going to host these PHP scripts on a server somewhere. Let me just kind of draw a little cloud here. Okay, and this is where the, the core exploit code is going to be located. All right, and then what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to find, the attacker is going to try to find a legitimate website. Let's say there's a legitimate um, website here. Okay. And he's going to try to lace that legitimate website with a little bit of surreptitious code, a small amount of surreptitious code. He's basically going to try to co-opt that existing website that's otherwise legitimate in most cases, but he's going to try to co-opt that legitimate website with a bit of surreptitious code. All right. And the surreptitious code is going to be designed so that anybody, of anybody who actually, let's say, uh, anybody browsing the web who goes to this site, uh, is going to, unbeknownst to them, be redirected. Okay, the surreptitious code is going to redirect traffic to the server hosting the exploit kit. All right. And now, I, I, at this point, the the code in the exploit kit will then get executed in the in the victim's browser. So let's say this is the victim's browser right here. Okay. Now I don't want to go into tremendous details on, on how uh, the compromise part of this happens. How does a legitimate website actually get laced with malicious code? There are many techniques uh, for doing this sort of thing. Uh, for example, maybe I'll just list a few here without describing in any detail what they are. Uh, but some of the common techniques include uh, SQL injection, just in case you ever uh, hear that term. That's one of the applications of SQL injection. There's also 
um, FTP server compromise um, as another example um, uh, malvertising okay these are just different ways in which surreptitious code can be placed somehow on a otherwise legitimate website uh, cross site scripting is another example but um, um, this list is probably already way too big now what the attacker can do of course is you can also sidestep this whole website compromise business and just try to trick victims into directly visiting the server containing the malicious code or containing the exploit kit for example by by sending out a spear phishing message with a link uh, directly to the server right here and that, that's another way to do it uh, but the most common way that we typically see is a legitimate server being compromised and then traffic to that server being redirected to the server that hosts the exploit kit. Okay, now let's say a victim visits one of these compromised pages. Uh, his browser is then going to, pretty much unbeknownst to him, end up fetching content from this, this malicious server right here and then that content is going to be rendered inside the user's browser. Okay, and what happens first, typically uh, the PHP scripts themselves, they won't actually do anything that's physically evident. There's not going to be any physical evidence, so to speak, um, because there's nothing that's typically displayed. These are pretty much, by and large, invisible to the end user. But what the scripts basically first do is they first fingerprint the user system. They try to figure out what's actually running on that system. And they try to identify if there are any applications on the user system which are vulnerable. Maybe, for example, the user has a vulnerable web browser, or maybe the user has a, a plugin that's vulnerable. Okay? And so really the fingerprinting part is all about getting versions of the browser, getting versions of the different plugins, and then the server is going to determine from this information, from the fingerprinting information, is going to determine if uh, any of these versions have known vulnerabilities. And moreover, if the server specifically has exploit code, to take advantage of those vulnerabilities. All right, and if the server determines that there are vulnerable applications and that there is exploit code it has, it is basically going to serve, serve this exploit code back to the user, okay? And this exploit code effectively will then get executed by the user's browser or by the plugins, all right? And the hope is that the exploit code will take advantage of either browser or plugin vulnerabilities and Upon compromising the user system, what's typically going to happen is that the, the victim system is going to end up, as part of this compromise, downloading a piece of malicious software, the actual payload. And typically, the attack toolkit is all about compromising the system, and ultimately what you want to deliver as part of that compromise is an actual payload, which is a piece of malware. And, and this payload will hopefully find its way onto the user system and compromise the user. And typically, uh, we see payloads like, for example, uh, Zeus, uh, Zero Access, which is a really uh, popular piece of malware today, uh, Crydex, uh, and others. And these are actually typically seen, uh, Black Hole, for example, I've seen using uh, these different payloads. All right. Now, once all this happens, you know, the user's been infected and so on and so forth, the Exploit kit actually, the code in the exploit kit is capable of tracking all of this activity. For example, exploit kits typically include code for determining the victim's geographic location through his internet protocol or IP address. And this is a concept uh, that's typically referred to as, uh, as GeoIP. All right, so there's typically some, some GeoIP capability to make a determination about where the user is physically located. Okay. And there are some freely available tools for doing GeoIP. So for example, uh, Black Hole uses a tool known as MaxMind, or a service known as MaxMind. Okay. I also want to point out that there are tools for doing, uh, for doing fingerprinting, for example. So Zero Access uses a, an open source tool known as uh, Plugin Detect. Okay. All right, so there are a lot of open source tools, freely available tools that when patched together, these tools may not themselves be malicious, but they could be used for malicious purposes, especially when packaged together. Okay. Now, all this geographic information that, that that's collected, all this this plugin information, browser information, and so on and so forth, is actually collected by the the server, by the server that hosts the exploit kit. All right. The exploit kit will track 
all this activity, okay? And once they track it, the idea is that they will take all this, this activity, this demographic information about victims, uh, information about what exploits they were susceptible to, uh, what environments they're running, and so on, and they will provide that data back. They're actually going to collect statistics. Uh, and in fact, I just want to point out, for example, in the, in the context of the, the black hole toolkit, uh, these statistics are stored in a, in a database. Actually, it's a MySQL database um, where they are stored. And then ultimately what will happen is um, the, the person running the kit, the actual kit operator, so to speak, will be given a management console a management console where they can actually see all these different stats. And these stats, again, are going to be stored typically in some type of database. Okay? And, um, and this is pretty neat. I mean, this is really going to show that this type of demographic information is very critical for, for the attacker. They want to know all this kind of stuff because they want to know if their attacks are succeeding and which attacks are succeeding and so on and so forth. They do take this very seriously. To them, it is a real business. Okay, so this is a pretty natural place, I think, for me to stop this video. In the next video, I'll talk a bit more about some of the, the underlying sophisticated techniques that are used by exploit kits to help thwart detection.